That's brilliant both. Right, let's go to the Q&A. So we'll start. Um, so what happens if the FRC path is not obtained? Some people pass after a few attempts or and is it the exam funded? Yeah, so should I take that one? So, um, yes, yeah, so the training allowance that comes into your trust as and it should be under your named individual HSST, um, that training allowance that comes in should be used to support sitting of the FRC PATH exam. So that includes the cost of the exam. Um, that also includes any sort of travel or accommodation that might be required to sit the exam. And it does include resits because we're really aware that it's an incredibly tough exam. Lots and lots of people do not pass th those exams for at the first attempt. Um, so it should the, the training allowance should be used to support mm. trainees for the number of attempts they need. Um, the FRC path offers four attempts per part. So four attempts for part one, four attempts for part four, part two. Um, and generally, we found that the vast majority of HSSTs, even if they've needed to resit, they have passed um, on those those resits. What happens if FRC PATH is not obtained? So HSST can't be completed without gaining FRC PATH for the life sciences. Um, we've not got to that point necessarily, but there are, you know, it is a possibility if someone doesn't pass the exam and if they use up all of those um, sittings with the FRC PATH and they're not able to attain um, FRC PATH, then they would not be able to complete the HSST programme. That's not been a common issue. Thanks, Lisa. Um, how many attempts are allowed for the FRC path? So, yeah, so that's not down to us. That's down to the um, Royal College. But obviously, like I said, you can use the funding towards the resets. It's four attempts per part. However, I will say I do know individuals who have, if they haven't passed on the fourth attempt, have applied for mitigating circumstances and have been permitted a fifth attempt. So it's very much down to the Royal College, but there you do get several attempts because these exams are so tough. I think it's it's important to acknowledge that. Um, what is an equivalent consultant grade to be a supervisor? So uh, I think, um, if you don't mind, Lisa, I'll um, yeah, okay. give this a first first shot. But um, as as I sort of said in the the opening, it's not it's not really um, a well described uh, role in some sciences. Um, so some scientists, uh, scientific disciplines, haven't had consultant clinical scientists historically. Some have. So we're looking at people who are equivalent in the sense that they have the same role and job functions within a department, same level of seniority and experience to be able to look at those standards and support a candidate to come through the training programme. So they'll be in a sufficiently senior role within their department, within their service and within their trust that they can, you know, uh, uh, fulfil the requirements of, of being a supervisor, uh, you know, being able to open doors, facilitate contacts, that sort of thing. Now, a, a more senior uh, HST you might expect to be able to engage more easily and be more self-sufficient, but at least the supervisor has a supportive function. So it's it's um, it's not very well defined in some disciplines. And in order to recognise that, we look for that level of seniority. Thanks, Owen. Um, for clinical bioengineering, when should is that clinical engineering be achieved? I don't know what that means. Sorry. That's the chartered engineering. Oh, chartered engineering. OK, I was there trying to work it out. <laughs> but that will be different for, for different candidates because different candidates might be uh, in a different position uh, on their journey towards that um, for the programme. So, I, I mean, the, the only way of sort of putting a timeline on it as to when it should be achieved, it's before the end of their completion deadline. Um, and there's quite a lot of flexibility within that. You might have already started that journey with that individual and you might achieve it relatively early on in the programme. It might be towards the end. The only thing about it being towards the end is there, there, there start to be a lot of things that you need to complete towards the end. And that's part of the reason why that extra 12 months was was put on the end as part of the programme to, to absorb some of that pressure of, 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 um, of completion requirements. Which leads us to the next question. So what happens yeah. if a trainee is unable to I mean, complete in those five plus one years? So so before we get to the, the start reality of, of that, I think what it'd be important to say is, yes, you know, you, you, it's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. But um, I think what we've emphasised quite a lot this morning 
is that you need to have training planning uh, and you need to be able to uh, recognize from your training planning when you're not progressing as you might wish and understand the reasons for that. So training planning is a key important uh, point for, for avoiding that situation. And as, as we've said quite a lot, um, it, it, you know, this is a five year program and there are a lot of life events that happen um, uh, in five years. We, people get promoted uh, um, uh, sometimes off the basis of work that they've already done on the program and, it, uh, and move, move places um, in that time period. And that has an impact on their ability to train. So there are there are processes in the school to to support mitigation for some of the impacts of things that, that um, candidates come across. It's important to be aware that there are support mechanisms. So we can't negate some of the challenges that they the candidates will face along the programme. But there are opportunities to buy yourself time to, to deal with challenges and then come back to training. Brill, at what stage should my trainee who has a PhD request exemption? So that's relatively early on in the programme. So you, you will have a uh, need to support your university in um, almost as soon as you can after induction, reach out through the university. Is that true? Because they get uh, signed. Yeah. So they'll be able to notify their university that they intend to complete the programme without. So what will happen is you will notify your university, then you'll make an application to the school and the school will re review the evidence and then um, either approve or uh, not approve the the um, the application to exempt yourself <coughs> from the programme uh, PhD require, uh, project requirement. So early on. Can you put a new statement on the website to say what the funding can be used for? So e.g. for equipment, including specialist so ICT. That's, yeah, that's very that's quite challenging, actually, um, because as soon as you put a list of things that, that can be it can be used for up, then the things that aren't on the list are then for excluded. So rather than, than do that, um, we leave it to the, 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 the trust and the individual to, to, to best manage that funding, to allow them to get to, 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 to best use that funding to support the service and the candidate in delivering that HSST. So there are some examples on the website. Giving a pr prescriptive list of things that it can be used for is actually more restrictive than it is uh, otherwise, mm -hmm. or it can be. Yeah, and I think we say it's it's a non-exhaustive list that's up there because it just yeah. just give examples, but actually it's to allow that flexibility so that departments can use it in the best way that they feel supports the training, um, and we don't put exclusions on there either for that reason. Well, Shall I take that there's a few around funding that's that have great. come up. <clears throat> Um, so can the funding be used from one year to another? So the funding comes in from your regional commissioners um, into the departments and it, it's really down to what how the trust handles that funding. So if they are able to put it, for example, with the research funding that comes in, there can be some more flexibility in terms of how the trust can allow that funding to be used um, over the course of the programme. If it comes in as part of the general educational budget, it is if the trust says that money has then ceased at the end of the mm -hmm. year then as a school we can't carry it over to the next year so it's really down to the financial team so i would say it, as soon as someone starts on this program it's to get to know the the finance team and the educational team within the trust who manage that those budgets um and ask how flexible can they be in terms of moving that money across year to year Okay. I think there was another one around does the does the money belong to the trainee at the end? Yeah, of the that's so, I'm just yeah. You know, so the money, it's money to support training. It is not an individual's. And sometimes when HSST sort of come to me and say, oh, I've not been able to spend all my money. I do say this, <laughs> this isn't an, an individual's money. This is public money that is used to support training. It's a, it's a it's a relationship between the department and the trainee to best utilise that to support the trainee to complete. So the, there are departmental needs and trainee needs that needs to be met out of that from me. What we'll do, we'll leave the questions now, but I'll keep those up because we've got another opportunity for Q&A yeah. uh, later. So don't worry, we will get those answered. We've now got a screen break, actually. So a little break because that was a lot, you know, we've covered a lot already. So we'll have 10 minutes. So if we take the top one.
uh, Owen, if we don't currently have a consultant clinical scientist in the department, who would be the best person to supervise? It relates to a question that was asked earlier, actually, and I can't remember how it was phrased, but essentially the, the answer is the same. It's the, the most appropriate person to be able to facilitate the delivery of the training. So it's there's um, th that could be a service manager uh, um, uh, who, who takes on that responsibility um, in terms of the, the, those roles that we outlined for the, the workplace supervisor, regularly meeting with the candidate, ensuring um, they have protected time um, uh, and engaging the, the department in the delivery of the, of the, the research project. Some of those will be um, delivered, uh, can be delivered by the most senior person within that department. Having said that, um, you might, it might be a sort of, they might be the workplace supervisor on paper. You might be um, best advised to seek support for, for things like consultant level training for life scientists, for example. Um, that, that candidate may need, um, is likely to need support for passing their exams. So you take on the responsibility for accessing that consultant level expertise to support um, uh, uh, accessing expertise to support their candidate to pass their exams. So, and, and the same would apply across the disciplines. So, it's a it's a, a professional judgment as to who's the best person to facilitate their training on site and whatever it is that that may be missing from from your portfolio of skills that um, you make sure you source that from from other sources. But essentially, that should have been sort of sorted out as part of accreditation. OK, thanks, Owen. The next one, um, I have a trainer who's moved to, I'm not quite sure what that means, but at the end of year end four. Of year four. I, yeah, I do not feel they are aware I would expect. How can I address this? So this is, I think this is where the progression side of things um, uh, steps in. So you're, you're, you're asked to make a, a training plan and constantly review it with your trainee um, and also go through the annual review points. So there are multiple points where you can pick up um, concerns with progress. Uh, and whenever that is, you then access your concerns, um, raise them with the appropriate people. So if it's concerns uh, about academic process, that would be through the universe, through the university. But obviously, you would need to keep the, the school involved in case that has broader impacts. Mm -hmm. And if it's more um, more broader in terms of uh, uh, workplace sort of progression and concerns, again, raise that with the school. You will get an annual. You will get an annual as part of the ARP. We we seek the 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 uh, appraisal of the workplace supervisor as part of that as standard. If an individual is promoted and moves trust, can the HSST be transferred with them? Uh, I, I think that the short answer to that is yes, but there are a number of provisos on that um, in that there's a process we have to go through to manage that transfer. Um, and that's to ensure that um, the centre the trainee is moving to can accommodate them and accommodate the delivery of the training. It's to ensure that the funding for the HST moves to the appropriate place as well. And then, you know, um, what the potential impacts are on their academic provision. So just as an example of that, the research project, if, if their research project is embedded in one particular trust, there are complications associated with moving that, which would need to be considered, thought through and mitigated for. Sometimes it's harder than others. But the, the short answer is yes, they can transfer the HST. You just We would encourage you to go through the uh, appropriate process and in good time, not after the fact, for sure. Thanks, Owen. Uh, is there currently a programme for pharmaceutical science, scientists? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. Currently, the I mean, the, the simple answer to that is no. Um, I know there's a, a number of uh, uh, pharmaceutical scientists out there who are interested. Uh, and if there are, then, you know, uh, get yourselves together and start developing your case and what that might look like and what the numbers are um, so that you might be able to engage with the, the school and then HSE and other parties that are involved in that decision making to, to make the case to, to have that provision. There's no, uh, I mean, I guess the short answer to that is there is no um, HSST program, but I guess all the old routes that existed before HSST for any science still exist. 
So can leftover funding money at the end of the six years be used for general departmental training? I mean, that's a, a, a sort of more complex question. Uh, uh, my, my gut feeling is the short answer to that is no. Um, it, it, that's, it really emphasises the importance of getting to know your finance department and how your money works within your department, because um, the, the money is awarded uh, slightly differently depending on what region you're in, but essentially it's an annual allocation and there are rules as to, to what happens at year end with funding in NHS budgets. People have engaged with research budgets and part, in partner organisations to, to manage money. So develop a good um, develop a good uh, relationship with your finance department uh, and see what can be done within your context. So, and a couple for Stuart now. So can you set up multiple users to access one file for the purpose of reviewing progress with the requirements of the programme, i.e. a supervisor and a coordinator? Uh, yes, so two ways in which uh, you need to request that from us. Um, there is the, the trainee can request it by a form. They, they have a part of their e-portfolio containing forms. There is a form, there is a add new assessor supervisor form. The trainee can fill that in. That comes to us. We, we can add the uh, additional member of staff. Or you could, um, you could do it via our service desk whose email address I gave you. And that email address is on every one of the one file pages uh, on the website. Uh, you can email the service desk and tell us, uh, you know, who's the supervisor, what's the email address, which trainee, and we can do that too. And then they have anybody additionally added has the exact same view as you do, as the one I showed you, and they and they then, by being associated with the trainee, when the trainee makes a submission, the trainee can then um, select who to send that submission to. So that's a long way of round to say the answer to that question is yes. Um, the next question. Can this be undone? That is also a yes. Um, <laughs> in that, um, yes, if you accidentally, uh, the trainee doesn't have to submit everything again, but uh, we have to help to undo that. So that again is drop a quick note to the um, to the service desk, and we just unlock the uh, we just unlock the um, the submission back to you to uh, tick and sign. So. Um, it doesn't need to be done again, but it does need a little bit of us to intervene to to undo the damage. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, so one for Owen now. Can the HSST supervisor be also an academic supervisor? Um, uh, I'm not sure of the exact nature of that question, but um, that there, again, there's probably a complex uh, answer to that in the sense that uh, the academic supervisor is appointed by the university. So it's appointed on the university side to support the candidate through the, that university's uh, processes and, and, and regulations. So they would have to know that. Um, in order to be that, I, I, I guess the answer is not no, but I think there would have to be a certain set of circumstances. They would have to have a relationship with that university to fulfil that role. Uh, again, if that's not quite the question you asked, then please repeat or clarify. Thanks, Owen. Additional to the already discussed requirements, do you need a specific accreditation to be a HSST supervisor? Uh, additional discussed requirements, accreditation. I mean, generally your HCPC registered and then, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what I can add to what's already put on the, um, on the, on the slides for the intended sort of, uh, caliber of the, of the supervisor, if you like. Uh, and that's what gets on in terms of the department. It's part of a departmental level accreditation, I would say. Um, and finally, I'm starting as a new supervisor. On average, how much time should I keep free for supervision? I mean, that's that's quite an open ended question. Uh, I think the recommendation is that you you meet once a month with your candidate. Um, but that uh, the, there's it's a recommend it's a recommendation. It's a guideline. You need to understand uh, your own trainee and your own trainee's needs and build up an appropriate uh, relationship with them. And that might change over the course of the, the programme as well. There'll be times when you need more 
um, because they're going through a particularly in, intense period of their uh, training program, and it, it might mean at other periods they're they're either getting more response, um, uh, more responsibility, uh, and taking more responsibility for their own, and needing your support less and less, or they're doing you know it's during periods that are particularly calm. They they're going away and working on their research analysis or something. So it will be, I think, quite flexible. Um, uh, across the thing but that's perhaps a question for for some of your peers as well go out there and talk to others who you have uh, who who you know have knowledge of the program and how it was for them i'm sure you'll find a little bit of a, a variation in experience and what happens if the research project thesis comes back with major modifications and the trainee is already in sixth year including additional extension okay so um yeah, so that uh, the, the 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 progress of your candidate along your HST, as we've said, is monitored um, regularly by yourselves as uh, supervisors by the school annually, um, and by the 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 the, um, the university in terms of progression along the requirements for their deacon size. So there are multiple points of of uh, of, pro of progress monitoring. And if there are any challenges with meeting any specific deadlines, they, it's it's vital that they're flagged up early. So we, what we sometimes have is candidates going a little bit quiet on the university side, and and things drag on. They're trying to people are trying to get in touch, and things go quiet for months on end, and that starts to eat into time. But when you you get into it, it's you know things happen, and um, candidates require a, um, a mitigation for those events that have impacted on on their training and there are avenues for that which extend the time to give that time that was affected to give it back so that everybody has the same uh, as so near as possible the same amount of time on prod on projects so um, generally speaking we don't get to this situation um, in an ideal world because we've we've anticipated and mitigated it for it already but that said uh, if the thesis comes back with major corrections a judgment will be made on the amount of other progress the candidate has made. So if this is the only thing outstanding on that candidate's uh, programme, then depending on the reasons that have uh, 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 caused that outcome, then we, we can look to applying to EC for mitigating circumstances to give them the time to complete. So that will be judged <laughs> on a case by case basis effectively. But generally speaking, we should have picked it up early and mitigated for it already. That's brilliant. Thank you both.